Good evening or afternoon to everyone. This lecture will be in English and I'm very pleased to introduce Julia Kimberly Colombo who is today's speaker. Uh, Julia Kimberly Colombo is PhD candidate from Milan University and uh, uh, in 2021 she co-curated uh, the exhibition, solo exhibition uh, of Anna Valeria Borsari, uh, Italian artist, and it's also the main topic of today's lecture. And uh, Julia also uh, wrote very interesting text which was published uh, in the publication um, in frame of, of this exhibition. Uh, and Anna Valeria Borsari, Julia will explain everything about her, but she's the leading person of conceptual art in Italy and also something like a pioneer of site-specific art. Uh, so I think it will be very interesting uh, lecture and we are very looking forward to this. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So good evening everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Giulia Kimberly Colombo. I'm a PhD candidate from University in uh, Milano. I'm really happy to be here today and to have the chance to introduce you to the work of Anna Valeria Borsari. So thank you to Professor Vendula Fremlova for inviting me here at Purkinio University today. So Anna Valeria Borsari is an Italian artist among the most prolific and interesting. She is a leading figure in what we consider the Italian conceptual scene of the second half of the 20th century, whose activity started in the late 60s and spans over more than five decades of Italian contemporary art, considering that Borsari is still active today. And today I'm going to uh, present the artist research and try to explain to you um, the development of her practice throughout a selection of some of her most remarkable works which I have chosen specifically to illustrate the main aspects and also the pillars of her um, of her lifelong career and as the title uh, shows and mentioned these are identity place and relationships uh, some themes that she confronts in quite a unique way, which I believe make her work still very relevant today, even for a younger generation of, of artists. I also want to add a quick word on the title. Why did I choose Sitting on the Stoop? Uh, well, the stoop is the entrance stairs to a building. So first of all, uh, it's a reference to a photograph from an installation that we'll see later in the presentation. But most importantly, in my view, the stoop uh, symbolized the point of contact between two places, not only uh, physical places, uh, but also metaphorical places. So an outward reality, namely an outside world, and, and the artist's inwardness. So I picked this image to convey the way that Anna Valeria Borsari's work relates to these two dimensions and how she's always trying to put these two dimensions into contact. And before we jump to, uh, into the history of her creative journey, I want to start by showing, her, showing you her latest project titled From Acropolis to Piraeus which was presented uh, recently at the end of November 2022 and which consists, as you can see from the picture, in a site-specific installation of an oil painting hanging on the remaining wall of a demolished building in Athens in the district of Pretaralona. And this intervention, which is also her first one outside of Italy, testifies, I think, for Borsari's long-standing research that is concerned with analyzing uh, the boundaries between a private and public dimension, uh, the interior and the exterior dimension that I, just, that I just mentioned, as well as the anonymity of the artistic gesture and also the poetic side of decay, which Borsari intends as an inevitable condition in human uh, existence and also for all human creations. And in fact, and it's important to know that this installation uh, was done anonymously 
and that the painting is not meant to be removed after a certain time, like you would do in a traditional artistic event. But on the contrary, it's meant to take on itself sort of the destiny of the very same building where it's installed, sort of intertwining um, its own life to the life of its surrounding. This means that the rain, uh, the sun, the wind will damage the painting and eventually even destroy it, but Borsari wishes uh, this for her site-specific work. Uh, she wishes her work to have this kind of fate to relate very deeply to an environment up to the point where the environment itself uh, sort of affects the artwork's course of existence. So we'll dive deep into all these aspects during the course of the presentation. And this was just to uh, give you a hint of uh, and to start our talk today. I also wanted to mention that my personal uh, interest and dedication uh, into investigating Ana Valeria Borsari's work originated a couple of years ago in 2020 um, when I had the chance to study Borsari's work closely in close contact to her and to her archive. And that was in view of the preparation of my dissertation. And the study also led me to collaborate with Anna Valeria in her personal exhibition at Museo del Novecento in Milano, which opened in autumn 2021. And here I inserted a few photos from this exhibition, just a few installations and reenactments from her previous work. And I wanted to show you this exhibition because I think it was relevant uh, for a number of reasons. Well, first of all, as I mentioned, uh, Anna Valeria Borsari has had a very long uh, career since the late 60s and early 70s, but this was her first uh, solo show in a public museum in Milano, so it was actually quite a big uh, recognition for her. And the aim of the curators was to really reposition uh, Borsari among a group of better known and better studied artists, especially male artists whose practice today we consider seminal and we consider groundbreaking. But our intention, mine and uh, Yolanda Ratti's, who's senior curator of the museum, and Giorgio Zanchetti, who's also uh, a professor of contemporary art at the University of Milano. So our intention was to reaffirm uh, Anna Valeria's role as a protagonist of that season and not just you know, as a secondary or marginal figure in the uh, Italian contemporary scene. But now moving on to the actual topic of today's lecture, I want to quickly add also a few words on Anna Valeria Borsari's uh, personal biography because much of her work has to do with her personal family history and with some events of her life. Starting from her childhood, um, and to the obstacles that she experienced trying to become, to lead an independent life and trying to become an artist, which in those years was quite a struggle for, my, for a woman, I would say, and even a very serious illness that affected her in the second part of her life. And here you can see a uh, very young Anna Valeria photographed by a friend of hers, uh, which is the photographer and painter Carlo Gaiani, while in the same moment she is drawing his portrait, which I inserted uh, next to the photos. And I thought this was a curious and also quite telling uh, of her future interest in relationships and in the creation of art that can engage with its viewer. So starting even from a very playful and naive mode like this one to going towards more intense and more sophisticated ways like the ones that we will um, analyze. Uh, Anna Valeria Borsari was born in 1943 in Bazzano. Bazzano is a small town outside of Bologna in the north of Italy uh, where her family had taken refuge during the war to escape a very heavy bombing for, of the city um, by the American allies. And, and she grew up, she grows up in a quite a wealthy, well-off and bourgeois context although it was marked by some serious uh, problematic relationships 
in particular, the one with her mother is very troubled uh, by constant conflicts that from a very early stage in her life contributed to a profound existential discomfort, if not even a latent uh, child depression. But on a positive note, um, since she was a child, Borsari uh, understood the emancipatory value of creativity, especially um, through drawing, which was her favorite activity in those years. And unfortunately, her family's main concern was, though, that above everything, she would get married. This means that her intellectual and artistic ambitions are not at all encouraged, as the general conviction in those years was that for a woman, uh, studying was a waste of time. And the culture of the time, of course, was very, uh, was particularly oppressive, and this led her to some painful renunciations and she had to give up enrolling in art school. And as a result, she also, she also had to take up on some ways of living, uh, which she always said they weren't for her. And her artistic aspirations are, are thus frustrated from a very young age. But furthermore, when she expresses the desire to enroll in the Faculty of Architecture in Florence, uh, once again, um, Anna Valeria's desire is denied by her parents, who just didn't see any professional future for her. But in the end, they allow her to enroll into university, so she had to pick the faculty that they wanted, and she enrolls in the Faculty of Literature and Philosophy at the University in Bologna. I would say that despite the understandable disappointment, this moment of her life uh, represents a time of great change, of great development for Anna Valeria Borsari, which, uh, where she is able to thrive upon and which will translate into her artistic work, because her studies in linguistics and the philosophy of language will prove to be all but marginal. Uh, and will also give a very definite conceptual imprint to her work, especially her uh, early work. I also wanted to uh, mention a couple of words on the artistic framework of the 60s and the 70s in Italy, just to clarify you know, the general context where she was operating. Um, and this is also to give some hints on the linguistic uh, innovations of those decades where the concept of site specificity uh, develops. So the late 60s and the 70s, of course, I'm sure you, you know, were a time uh, where art was greatly concerned with engaging with the reality in a more direct, active, even political way. So the new avant-gardes were highly critical of the traditional artistic system and of the idea of the artwork as a commercial good, a very conservative idea of what the artwork is. Also, remember that the 1968 Venice Biennale was marked by great protests. Uh, many pavilions were closed um, or, or empty. And the few works on display were shown, uh, turned over or thrown on the ground. And in such, in, in a general context of upheaval and of radical change, art increasingly uh, abandons institutional exhibition spaces uh, to embrace the public sphere and unconventional spaces like the urban or natural landscapes. So it's no surprise that performance, happenings, land art and conceptual art flourished out of an anti-formal attitude as a means to go beyond the commercial value of the art object to engage with the viewer and to impact reality also on a social and a political level. So, of course, Italy and the city of Bologna in the 60s are not strangers to such artistic uh, and intellectual innovations. And through her academic circle, Anna Valeria is introduced to conceptual art, uh, especially the Anglo-Saxon conceptual artists who were behind the magazine Art and Language, uh, founded in uh, May 1969. I inserted the very first issue of this uh, seminal uh, magazine that for sure Anna Valeria was very influenced by. 
And a few years later, the Italian pavilion of 1972 Venice Biennale, which uh, for sure Borsari had the, the chance to visit, is dedicated to a single theme. In, Italy, in Italian we say opera o comportamento, meaning artwork or behavior. And this shows that the whole exhibition was founded on the contrast between these two poles. So on one side, the work of art intended as a painting or a sculpture, and on the other side, a widespread, uh, ever-growing tendency to stray away from these closed forms uh, into performance and into installation. And I inserted the, um, the banner for this exhibition of the 1972 Biennale here in the middle picture. And lastly, I wanted to mention the seminal work by Italian photographer Ugo Mulas, which I deeply love and um, deeply appreciate. Uh, he was a contemporary of uh, Anna Valeria Borsari and their photographic research was contemporary. In fact, their work uh, carries some striking similarities, although they had never met. And unfortunately, Mulas dies really young in 1974. But all of these examples of the things that Anna Valeria encountered in her early adult life is to clarify that she was very aware and integrated in the artistic ethos of her time. So finally, Borsari graduates in 1967 and having not completely uh, given up on her artistic inclinations, she decides to rent a small garage in Bologna and she starts producing her very first works, which are a group of painted sculpture made out of wood and plexiglass, which she will only exhibit many years later uh, in 1975 in her very first uh, solo show in Rome. But of these very first sculptures, uh, the most significant, in my opinion, is the one you see in the picture on the right called Identification in the Mirror, uh, still from 1967, which is a strange object made up of two symmetrical wooden panels that you can see here on the ground. They're separated by a square mirror. And both panels are painted with the same uh, simplified marine landscape. You can discern uh, a yellow sun on a lighter tone of blue sky and then a strip of darker blue, which, is, uh, which identifies the sea. And turning around the, the sculpture only from a certain angle, the reflection in the mirror makes it look like you're, you're seeing past it, uh, like you are seeing both panels where in reality you're only seeing one panel and it's its own reflection in the mirror. And I think it's interesting because the mirror here is used like a visual threshold uh, to merge the reality of the viewer's perspective and an imaginative dimension which is only inside the work of art. And just as reference, I also inserted the mirror paintings by Michelangelo Pistoletto, uh, who is a renowned Italian conceptual artist who was also very intrigued and very uh, fascinated by the linguistic and uh, poetic possibilities of mirrors. And the work you see here is actually from the Novecento Museum collection. And in Pistoletto's work, uh, when the viewer stands in front of the mirror painting, he or she becomes part of a scene. It's almost like the viewer becomes one with the representation in the mirror and sort of fusing the presence of the viewer with uh, one existing only inside of the painting. So even if we are still in the scope of the closed object in the stage of Borsari's production, I think these early sculptures incorporate her interest in visual distortions, in proportions, and at this point of her research, I think it's evident that she's trying to figure out ways to establish a relationship with her surroundings and with the viewer, so, sort of to surprise the viewer. But another very important step is taken when Anna Valeria Borsari first, first starts to play and experiment with photography. And this happens quite casually uh, in December 1967 when she takes her very first uh, photos during a walk in the snowy countryside in the company of a friend of hers. 
and the photographs that make up this first series, titled Sulla Neve, in English, On the Snow, uh, show the remains of an interrupted construction site of a house uh, in a snowy landscape. And in my interpretation of this uh, first employment of photography, I focused on the choice of subject. Why did Borsari feel the urge to portray the construction site, I asked myself. And I think that perhaps the unfinished house could be an illusion or uh, yeah, a suggestion to her own uh, subjectivity, to her own personal identity. Because after all, uh, in this stage of her early adult life, she might have felt that her own persona was very much unexpressed, still unexpressed and very much under construction, we could say, such as you know, in the construction side. And the second subject is the one you see here on the right. These, are, these circles are the metal rims of a wooden barrel. Uh, what Borsari did here is that she picked up the rims and threw them on the snow just before an animal walked by and left its paw prints. So the interesting thing here is that the composition that she was trying to achieve is almost disturbed by an unpredictable event, in this case it's the passage of, of an animal. And this will later become one of the most sought after traits for Borsari in all her site specific installations, namely, namely the unpredictable effect that an environment can have on a structured artistic creation. Uh, this is because the footprints will be erased by a new snowfall or melted by the sun and the metal rims will for sure be moved by uh, a worker who um, was completely unaware of Borsari's artistic aim. And as much as many of the artist site-specific installations are meant to disappear, uh, photography is still used and becomes the tool to preserve not the artwork, but its memory. And the 1970s are also a crucial uh, decade in Anna Valeria Borsari's artistic path. And it's important to outline a few aspects of her evolving practice in this particular phase of her activity. For one thing, on a technical level, this moment is characterized by an almost exclusive use of photography. In fact, Borsari starts to take lessons she learns to shoot, she learns to develop her own film, and this, is, this necessarily increases her awareness of the poetics and expressive potential of photography. But the way that the artist employs photography, I think, is quite unique because we have works like the one you see on the left, um, where Borsari experiments with the framing and other kinds of physical manipulations and interventions. She might manipulate the film during the development phase uh, to change the exposure time, or she might incline the paper, such in this case, uh, during the printing phase. Or in other works, such as this one on the right, Borsari plays with the association of images and text to ironically suggest alternatives to our conventional logical systems. Or, such as in this case, um, this is Icarus, a series of seven photographs of the same young man portrayed with arms open in a natural landscape. Um, in this series, uh, this series shows how the point of view of the camera can considerably alter our perception of, of reality. In fact, the position of the young man is always the same. But in some shots, Borsari made it look like she, he is detaching from the ground and, and flying, hence the title Icarus, of course. But, you know, whereas the effect is just given by the shifting point of view of the camera. So we can thus understand uh, how photography is the medium that the artist uh, uses to either express her need for introspection, such as in the case of on the snow, or to escape um, the conventionality of certain rules. In fact, each different manipulation of these shots is meant to uh, contradict the rules of perspective to achieve a form of freedom 
uh, from tradition, even a concrete break from conventionality, even if it's just in the domain of artistic creation. And this is when her personal history comes in handy to understand this kind of production. In fact, Borsari remembers, and I'm going to cite her own words, in those years I had big problems with authority and a constrictive type of culture. And I tried to oppose it with the infinite points of views of alternative logical systems. All of these lesser known works, which constitute my earliest career, allow to better understand the motives of my research. In the first half of the 70s, I was definitely searching for a language and for tools. I was elaborating a unique way to move forward in my research. And moving on, the years 1976-1977 may mark a crucial shift in Anna Valeria Borsari's work. We see that the use of uh, photography becomes more and more conceptualized. And Borsari also increasingly associates uh, photography to performance and to installations. In 1976, she produces Testimonianze, in English, Testimonies. Here I only inserted four panels of the whole series, which is made up of, of six, but this is so you can at least have a sense of the written sentences. And what happens here is she tries to express the distance between photography or, or images in general and concrete reality. And she comes up with uh, short sentences to describe events of or ordinary experiences and then she tries to pair them with the corresponding image for example uh, I translated the, the from the Italian someone gifted me a doll and then the doll is pictured with this photograph I was lost on the beach and we have the beach or um, someone took a photo of me and then you have the photo but mm, in the end, the paradox becomes even more evident when she writes, now I'm here, and the here is just plain paper, is unrepresentable. So our very own um, presence in the world uh, and our own experience of the world has no possible representation. This is what she's trying to, uh, to show. And this is one of the last steps that separates her from finally embracing uh, performance to express herself artistically. I think uh, a work like this one deals with the intrinsic limitations of photography and shows that Borsari is also becoming uh, growingly unsatisfied with the static nature of images. And I also would like to touch on another point a work like Testimonies conveys a reflection around the theme of identity. And for Borsari, identity um, can never be clearly outlined because it's not, of course, a static concept. It's not a transparent uh, concept. And for her, identity is always um, investigated with reference to lived experience. And identity is also strongly connected to our relationships, of course. Uh, to others, to our environment as well. And this is why the artist also rejects uh, traditional forms of self-representation. She never portrays herself, or very seldomly she does that. And she prefers to allude to one's identity uh, rather than failing to convey it through an image. And this is evident, for example, in these two series from 1976, where the identity of the person living in these two apartments is unknown because we never actually see the person. Uh, but nonetheless, it's evoked through the investigations of the traces uh, left in these rooms. Uh, for instance, their, their belongings, the clothes, the books, um, and every detail is meticulously observed by the camera. And I think what she, wants to, what she wants to prove is that the environment uh, where we live can tell a lot about ourselves. Uh, we're deeply connected to an environment, uh, so will be her work as well. And Borsari is also progressively turning her attention to the outside, uh, to what's around her, and investigating the traces more than looking for you know, herself in, in her works. 
And in, in these last year of the 70s, another important conceptual achievement progressively sets in, in her work, namely the attempt to activate and express a relationship with others. Uh, we in fact notice that photography is no longer intended as a tool for grasping reality to analyze the mechanism of our perception, uh, but essentially becomes a place and a symbol for relationships. And this is evident in a work like this one, which is called Photos by Carla B. And this is a very important work, which requires a little bit of an explanation, a context explanation. So Anna Valeria marries uh, very early in her life to basically escape her family. Um, she marries a friend, a psychoanalyst, and they only live together for one year, then she divorces them, but um, they have a child together. And during the year there, that they live together, um, he, of course, received phone calls from his patients. And one of these patients was a woman named Carla. And uh, one day, Anna Valeria answers the phone and they start talking. And Carla wants to get to know her because she's, uh, Carla's very lonely. She's also quite depressed and she never goes out of the house. So she's longing to find someone to connect with. And Carla starts to call at home and ask to, to speak to Anna Valeria instead of her husband. So they establish a relationship, a phone relationship, uh, but they two, the two never met, nor they ever will meet. And this goes on for quite some time until one day Anna Valeria asks Carla to leave the house, go to the beach of her city and take some photos to show her what she was seeing. And then once she asks Carla to send them back to her and so that she can see them. So Carla accepts and to go out and actually takes very beautiful and poetic photos, I think, even if they are a little bit um, damaged, they're very old film photos, but here I inserted some of them. And it's important to underline one fact that this work doesn't originate from Anna Valeria's creative act. Uh, on the contrary, uh, it's almost as if life itself uh, dictates uh, the birth and the development of this work because Borsari only reacts to a solicitation, to an external solicitation to establish a relationship which then, so to say, takes the form of these photographs. And, um, and I would say that here Borsari is already, you know, given way to uncontrolled events to direct the faith of her creations. What I like about this work, which is often exhibited in, like you see in this, in this picture, just randomly throwing the photos on a little table. And uh, what I like about this work is that it proves that physical distance doesn't prevent the relationship to flourish. And photography here is used as a tool really to express the relationship between Carla and Anna Valeria. And the only thing that Anna Valeria did here she, was that she added a few notes that I pasted here on the slide and you can, you can see. And here she clarifies all the steps that brought her to the existence of the work. In fact, we read that to take these photos, Carla had to dust off a camera that she hadn't used in 10 years. She had to get ready. She went out, bought new film, made arrangements with someone to develop it. And she walked on the beach, observed others around her. She ran, she laughed. She made arrangement with me and honored it. And Carla did not like these photos, but she had a lot of fun taking them. And, and she also adds, while taking these photos, Carla realized that the camera granted her a different role, the, the one of a photographer, in such a way that it justified her presence. Uh, her gestures, a dialogue with others and situations that she normally excludes herself from. And the most important phrase, I think, is that is the last one, I never met Carla B. So can you see how dynamic the structure of this work is? Because the work itself is not just the photos. Uh, it's really the relationship between Anna Valeria and, and Carla. And the evolution 
of the artist's expressive modes is at this point almost accomplished. Uh, 1977 is a, a year of some major and complex works that finally embrace the environment and hence the note that her personal interpretation of site-specific uh, site is um, fully mature. And the photos that I'm going to show you now are from uh, an action um, or performance, we could say, carried out in three different cities, um, three different occasions, in Bologna in 1977, in Milano in 1978, and in Florence in 1979. And what happens in this performance, we see on the right a young Anna Valeria, who arrives in the public square of one of these three cities, unannounced, and starts making a very simple um, image of a Virgin Mary, of a Madonna, on the ground using only two things, the coins and different types of seeds. Of course, nobody could tell that a performance was taking place because in those years it was quite frequent for street artists to decorate the floors of public squares and the streets with the image of the Virgin Mary. Today, I don't even think it is possible anymore or it's allowed anymore, but at, the, at that time it was. So by acting like any other street artist, um, she, she really blends in with, any, with the other bystanders. And naturally, she attracts uh, quite, quite a crowd around her. People are really intrigued by what this young woman is doing. And they observe her all, all along. But after she's done completing, you know, creating the image of the Virgin Mary, uh, Borsari simply walks away and leaves her Madonna unattended. At this point, something really interesting happens, uh, something really curious happens because the people jump on the image and they start stealing the coins. As you can see from, from these photos, they really immediately jump on it and, and they steal the coins, but that's not all. Oh, here you see the, the image after some coins have been stolen and it's already quite disturbed. But that's not all because also the birds dash on the Madonna and of course they, they eat the seeds. So as a result, the work disappears in the end. And we might even say that the image is almost, um, almost blends in with the environment because each person you know, might have picked up a few coins and the birds even ate the seeds. So it's almost like the artwork was reabsorbed by the environment almost. And what's even more striking is that nobody is aware of the fact that this was intentional, that this was supposed to happen. So a point that I really want to stress out is anonymity. And anonymity is crucial in Borsari's work. She believes that people are influenced by knowing that an artistic event is taking place. And this can lead to prejudices in the way that people see and perceive art. So by concealing the framework around her actions and around her work, people can feel less conditioned, less constrained, to judge it as art and therefore allowing for a more free experience of the work and choosing anonymity of course for her is a way to establish a stronger relationship with a stronger dialogue also with her with the public with her viewers because imagine if people knew that this was a performance of course they would have never picked up the coins um, but on the contrary here they don't care if they ruin it, they don't care to touch it. And of course, another fundamental element of a work like this one and all the, the works that we'll see next is the choice of the place. Because places are always carefully chosen by virtue of their history, of their function, or for a specific natural characteristic that um, is suitable, that for her is suitable for activating a sort of exchange with the environment uh, and with the intervention carried out by the artist. Uh, in this way, the works really becomes um, not just an add-on, but an organic presence in a given place because the artwork is designed to become a part of a vital transformative 
process, and this is the reason why um, Borsari's site-specific operations are often uh, ephemeral or have a transitory character to them. So in a sense, we could affirm that the artwork almost belongs to the world and it's not immortal. And on the contrary, it's actually mortal and perishable, just like everything and, and everybody else. Another example of what I'm talking about is this monumental earth work, we could say land art work, uh, that uh, you can see here on the slide. This is called Donna Isola e Ponte, Woman, Island and Bridge, from 1982. Um, this work consisted in the shape of a female figure, almost um, carved out from the wild plants with the use of an excavator by Anna Valeria herself. Uh, on a small island on the river Reno, just outside Bologna. And the womanly silhouette is only visible, visible only by the passengers from, of a train that was passing um, nearby through the area. You can see the, the train tracks from you know, the same area. But for all other visitors, um, the artist's intervention was not recognizable. And these photos on the left are taken from the Woman Island Bridge, from the womanly silhouette. And probably you can see it better from the photo one and two. Uh, over the course of the weeks, the image was reabsorbed uh, by the swelling of the river, by the rain and wind, and by the growing plants, until it was completely um, reabsorbed, re completely cancelled. So it was only for a lucky handful of train passengers. Um, it was only visible to them and it must have been, I'm sure, a quite a pleasant surprise passing by the train to see this womanly figure where you could not really figure out if it was just your impression. Is that really a woman silhouette or did someone make it? So it's always on the border of these two poles. And in my thesis, I also underline an affinity with the intervention by Ana Mendieta, who is a very famous Cuban artist who created her famous um, series called Silhuetas, Silhouettes, between 1979 and 1985. And she mainly did this these Silhuetas working in uh, the United States, in Iowa and in Mexico. And these works as well are a reproduction of a female silhouette made using her own body in contact with natural supports such as um, sand, earth, or mud. And then Ana Mendieta as well left them to their fate and to the cancelling action of the weather. So physical cancellation also for Mendieta plays an important role in her poetics. And although um, Borsari and Mendieta never met, and of course they refer to very different cultural systems, I still thought it was interesting that such different figures could find almost the same way to express their desire and their need to fuse with nature, to find you know, a way to get closer to nature and to embrace this poetic of decay, which I also find in, in Mendieta's work is quite, quite present. And moving on to another um, site-specific installation, um, this is Urban Cross Section from 1999. So what happened here is quite interesting. One morning in March in 1999, the Milanese neighborhood of Brera uh, woke up to uh, really greet the presence of these two oval paintings, a male and a, fig and a female portrait, that were left hanging on the walls of a ruined house in a building destined to be demolished. Um, and naturally, these, this strange presence sparked many questions by the, the residents of the neighborhood. But interestingly, no one suspected that the paintings were part of a site-specific work that was really designed to dialogue with the walls of this very building and with the surrounding urban context. In fact, Anna Valeria had the the two paintings installed at dawn, completely secretly, without informing anyone. And um, the title refers uh, or alludes um, to the physical insertion into uh, the city landscape, but also to the intention of bringing together 
uh, a, we could say, purely private dimension and, and to bring it to the attention of the public sphere. So uh, a cross section between these two different dimensions. There was even an article published in August 1999 in a national newspaper that mentions the, the numerous questions that kept arising even months later about the meaning <clears throat> of this operation. <clears throat> and I would like to read a few sentences from the article that I think are suitable. And the article says, the paintings are unreachable on that discolored wall that has been exposed to water, sun, and frost for 30 years. The renovation works should start next year, and when the building will no longer be able to stand on its own, all traces of the past will be erased. Then the two portraits will have to start looking for another home. So the article, I think, perfectly captures what fascinated citizens the most, that the painting seems to rekindle that atmosphere of familiarity, uh, of irrecoverable domestic intimacy that certainly once circulated between you know, the, the walls of that room and that building. And the domestic sphere is also really important for Anna Valeria Borsari. So is the contrast between intimacy and public, between an interior and an exterior. And when these two dimensions are put into contact, such as in this case, I think the alienating effect can be, can be really, really strong. Okay, so in the next uh, couple of slides, I would like to show you two different kinds of site specifics that mm, in this case, um, this one also relates to the domestic, mm, domestic sphere. Um, these are carried out in the late 90s and they employ painting and photography, but in a different way uh, than the one I explained just before. Instead of leaving the paintings to a progressive um, and inexorable decay, paintings here are um, used as tools, I would say, to recreate the environment, and I'll ex explain myself. This work, and also the next two photos, uh, is titled uh, Ring, Ring Borsari. Ring Borsari, as you would tell a friend that uh, comes to visit you at home for the first time, you would tell him, ring my name on the buzzer. Um, and um, here the artist painted some fictitious furniture in what was supposed to become her studio apartment in Milano. But unfortunately, in the mid 80s, Borsari was struck by a very severe illness that kept her from conducting a normal life for almost a decade, let alone keep going with her artistic activity. And in fact, she had bought this apartment to move away from Bologna, to move to Milano, and to focus on her growing career. Uh, she was starting to receive her first big acknowledgements. She was endorsed by the critics, and um, a few galleries were also following her work closely. And a younger generation of artists um, was aware of the importance of her conceptual site-specific work. So it was a really good moment of her life before she discovered that she was severely sick. And she had a good network of supporting figures. Um, her work, I would say, was generally very well regarded. But when she discovered that her health was in serious danger, all of this was put on hold for 10 years. So this, this very installation uh, comes after a decade of fighting with such illness. And uh, when she started to get better, Borsari finally went back to the apartment where she had hoped um, to have a happy life, which unfortunately she didn't have. In fact, she recalls, um, I hadn't done many things that I should have and wanted to do. Once I recovered, I returned to the small rundown apartment that was supposed to become my studio in Milano. I found it intact, albeit even more dusty, and I decided to do a work with it. And here we get to the actual installation. So Borsari opened up her apartment for public visits and she reproduced on large canvases what could have been the furnishings and the objects of the house. For example, we see a table with two chairs uh, covered with papers and we also have uh, a wooden wardrobe, we have a bed. 
Um, there was another photo that I didn't insert with the pendulum clock. We also have an easel with a, a white blank canvas on it waiting to be painted. And in each painting, the background um, accurately reproduces the wallpaper motifs of, uh, that decorated the apartment uh, through the trompe l'oeil technique. And of course, this is, this is still a site-specific work, although painting here is used to, I would say, materialize an imaginary life, um, because these paintings are sort of ghostly emanations from the walls themselves of a life that could have possibly been, but never was or nor will be. And just like the mirror that we have seen in the earliest sculptures, painting here act as a, a threshold uh, between reality and imagination, almost like a surface that is concretely situated in the world, but that interacts with it on a more poetic and imaginative level. So instead of being used in a traditional sense to uh, depict or represent nature, um, such as painting was normally used, uh, here, it shapes an imaginary reality, which is nonetheless, I think, really um, real for her. And photography is, once again, used to document the installation, which was open for uh, and lasted a few years, I think. And unfortunately, Anna Valeria had to sell the apartment after she got better, and the paintings today are still um, stored in her new studio. And the same, I think, happens here. This um, is tear, or we could say tear, uh, same spelling, different meaning, but still related to the meaning of this installation. And this work is based on a mutual reference between the personal photograph and the space of the wall. And here we have a black and white photograph taken from a family album uh, that shows Anna Valeria Borsari as a, as a kid, as a child, portrayed next to some friends during, I think, a snack uh, on the day of her first communion. So we see little Anna Valeria in the center. She's the girl in the center. Um, and her hair is well combed and her napkin is tucked in into her white dress. So she barely smiles and her little hands are like resting very politely on the table covered with all the cups and pastries. I think Anna Valeria picked this picture because she looks really graceful and motionless like a doll. And I think she picked it because this is the way her mother would have wanted her to be. Um, just like a, a little gracious, beautiful doll. Then in tempera painting, she reproduce the pink flowers. I hope you can pick it up from the slide. The pink flower motif of the wallpaper of her bedroom as a child. And this delicate and very minimal intervention uh, is enough to contextualize the work and to amplify the emotional content which is enclosed in the picture. And to me, the central aspect of this work is a reflection on the very concept of place because the question is, what defines a place for us? And definitely emotions uh, define place. Emotions structure our perception of space and time. And to some extent, they can even evoke a place, regardless of the distance, for example, through photographs. And this confirms that in Anna Valeria Borsari, the idea of place gradually acquires a, a range of unprecedented nuances, becomes really layered. Um, and her idea, her concept of place, calls into account, of course, material elements, so the wall, uh, space, and our senses through which we experience the space, but also intangible elements such as feelings or memories or fantasies, of course. And lastly, we have arrived to the last work that I chose for the presentation. This is called Lotteria, Lottery and it's from the year 2000. I would qualify lottery or lotteria more like a happening than an actual performance because it's basically a lottery whose uh, prizes are made up of dozens of Anna Valeria's personal objects and keepsakes. 
So by purchasing a ticket, the participants or the visitors could win one of the artist's uh, memorabilia. They, they could win, you can see old photographs, uh, a pair of shoes, uh, even her wedding dress was there, you can see it on the left. Um, her doll, the doll she used to play with, or the doll, or the ball also that she used to play with as a child. Um, some books, uh, newspapers, diary entries. We have notes, letters to friends and, and family and relatives. Um, all sorts of objects, maps, uh, travel souvenirs. And together, these, these things constitute a very um, atypical uh, personal biography or even an unusual narration of her life, almost a portrait of the artist. So little by little, the objects disappear, of course, because people win the prizes. And they're taken by the visitors under the eyes of Anna Valeria, who uh, attended the whole event with a lot of apprehension, as uh, she told me. And well, in reality, not all of them were lost because we were able to partially reconstruct the lottery in the exhibition at Museo del Novecento, which we uh, reconstructed here in the photo on the right. But, you know, besides the feeling, this is her actually picking one of the prizes or rehearsing the, the happening. And I think that besides the, fe the feeling um, of, you know, astonishment for the fact that someone would even think to disperse their own belongings through a lottery, I think there's more to say because, of course, it goes without saying that the lottery has a disturbing similarity to an altar and Borsari herself admits that a sense of, of rituality, of sacrifice, of sacredness even uh, permeates all her work. Uh, it's quite explicit here, I think. But yes, what we observe here is definitely a death ritual. But I find that in Anna Valeria's work, death is not the end. Uh, it's actually a beginning, or anyway, a step in a never-ending cycle of transformation. Because what constituted the, the, the pieces of her life, uh, either a happy souvenir or a painful one, uh, is meant to go and take on a different purpose in someone else's path or life path. So ultimately, yes, she is staging her own death or dissolution. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, because this was, this was curated by a gallery. Um, the choice of the gallery was also, I think, specific because galleries are places of commercial transactions, of course. Uh, so the fact that you would buy each piece was m meant you know, to, to be underlined. No, 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 because you just extract the prize and lotteries work like this. You, you don't know what prizes you're going to get. So it could be, you know, the doll or the, the echography from her first um, child or anything really from every step of her life, from her childhood to that very moment. So as I was saying, yes, ultimately she is staging her own dissolution. Um, but I think it's done so to allow her to turn a page in her life and in fact after the year 2000 she will finally leave Bologna which she was trying to do for many years and for good and finally move to Milano with her only son and she she always says that that marked a new chapter in her life and hopefully a happier chapter for her so that's it <laughs> <laughs> thank you Thank you very much for Thank such you. an interesting lecture. And if something attracted your attention, please ask. Maybe you could turn on the light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you for listening, first of all. If you had any, I hope I didn't rush too much with the explanation. Um, okay. If, if you have any curiosities or any even comment or a thought about her work. I would be glad to hear it. Maybe.
the other half. Yes. I have the feeling that uh, her work are something like open structures. Yes. Yeah, which maybe also uh, is somehow linked to her uh, linguistic and philosophical studies. And as I read, she was very close to Umberto's echo. Yes, yeah, yes. So maybe if you could say something about this? I think, yeah. yes, Umberto Eco is a very renowned uh, Italian um, professor in semiotics and uh, a very renowned intellectual of the 60s and 70s. And he was the author of a seminal book called Opera Aperta, Open Artwork, which um, became viral, <laughs> we could say, in those years. And he theorized the idea that the viewer had to have a part in the, in the meaning or in the life of the artwork because it was time for art to become more engaged with reality and viewers had to take a part in, in yes, not just the artwork's life but also the meaning. So he advocated for a wider, more layered, nuanced meaning of artworks. And for sure, Anna Valeria was uh, exposed to Umberto Eco's ideas. Um, she was also exposed to the ideas of Luciano Anceschi, who was another uh, very uh, well-known academic from the University of Bologna. She was actually a pupil for, from, of uh, Luciano Anceschi and himself as well. He was an advocate for the, he calls it the heteronymity of art, meaning the openness of the meaning. So I think her academic exposure, um, her academic um, um, circle uh, definitely brought her to um, theorize this openness in the artwork, this sort of uh, letting life um, do uncontrolled things to the artwork and letting the viewer become a part of it. Um, and yes, definitely that is a, absolutely a correct mm -hmm. reference. Um, not just in theory, because yeah. many artists incorporate it in theory, but in her work I think it's quite explicit mm -hmm. in the way that she sort of abandons that idea of a very closed, structured um, artwork in favor of something more um, unpredictable, something open. Yeah. And, uh, basically, what we only have of the, all of these works that I showed you are the photographs, uh, which she does not intend as artworks themselves, unlike the land artists who exhibited mm -hmm. the photographs of their uh, installations and in landscapes as the actual work of art, but she's very critical of that kind of uh, approach because to her the, pho the photography is just an aid to memory and not the artwork. Mm -hmm. The artwork is gone forever. Yes, thank you. Except of when she was exhibiting her photographs. I'm sorry? <laughs> Except of when she was exhibiting her own photographs. <laughs> yes, but I mean, she does that. Uh, in fact, no, that's a correct no, remark that you're making because the exhibition that we did was in the archive section of the museum. So it had a connection with the idea that we're presenting documents of her work more than her actual work. We tried to re-enact some some of these installations, but they are more considered as relics. That um, that's not as of as how she was thinking about the photos, for example, like the snowy photos and so on, like in the beginning of the presentation. Uh, what, she, like what, what approach she had towards photography as a medium of art, like. I'm the, sorry. Her I'm approach, sorry. Like her approach to photography as a medium of art, like how it, it changes in time because. Yeah. Um, as I tried to explain, first photograph photography is the medium through which she really looks at the world, uh, even quite physically, it's mm -hmm. her eyes. But then she becomes quite unsatisfied with just having images. She becomes, she longs for something more ex experiential, experiential. Um, something more engaging of her own presence, of space, of people. So I think her idea of photography really changes in time. And when she was 23, she didn't even consider those as artworks. She was just finding a way to express herself in a, in a time of her life where she was really bottled up and constrained. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> was she a part of some community or a group? artistic group or no, something like that? No, she was always very isolated. Yeah. She lived a, a quite a, a 
mm, I'm not, I don't want to say a recluded life, um, but as an artist, she always, she was close to many artists, but mm. never um, really collaborated in a, in a community or um, in wider um, operations, artistic operations. But what she did, uh, she was very active for the defense of, uh, social defense of mental illnesses mm -hmm. um, due to her son's condition. So apart from being, you know, a well-renowned artist, she was also uh, quite active and she spoke strongly for the rights of people with uh, mental mental diseases uh, throughout all her son's life and she, she even had I think an association mm -hmm. uh, she opened up this association where she would have people come over and have lectures about mental illness um, she even made some works in uh, mental illness hospitals so there was an exchange in the sense that she was always very positioned in society. She was never uh, detached from the world. But as an artist, she always follow, followed her own path. Yes. And I would like to ask you, you mentioned that the exhibition in Museum del Novecento, mm -hmm. that the intention was to re-establish yes. her work or yes. her, her personality in the frame of yes. the Italian art scene. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, what kind of uh, res res um, answers you, you got to these? To this what kind of answers we receive yeah, from the public? Yeah. Uh, I would say positive, very positive, because first of all, some of her work can really uh, be emotionally, I think, really engaging. So people, even that did never heard her name, uh, had let us know that they really, really enjoyed the exhibition. And uh, also, some critics from her contemporary, um, she said that they wrote to her and they were really happy that this was happening to her and that they, we, we were giving her so much space uh, in Milano, um, where she had lived for you know 20 years and never gave her any public recognition, so it was really time. But I would say mostly we got a very positive reaction, both from the public and also from critics. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. I was also thinking about what she was doing in the tenth year long period as when she got sick. Like if she also did any art or was she like Yes, I, uh, like, she like, attempted, uh, of course not mm, very complex installations. She drew a lot. Mm -hmm. She was drawing, um, she was writing a lot. Mm -hmm. But m mainly those years are mm, kind of like avoid uh, so to say because she was she suffered from paralysis also at a certain point so she couldn't move or she had difficulties getting out of bed and of course she had her son with her um, that she had to take care of so it was really a tough moment of her life but she was she was drawing and doing very interesting ink drawings where she would pour the ink and doing like these rosh -rosh, um, um, shapes um, quite introspective as well, um, quite did this, emotional. Did, did, did this start appearing in her like later works then? Like did she carry this with her? I'm sorry. <laughs> <I don't know laughs> you could just raise the mic yeah. a little bit. Uh, uh, if she continued doing this like with her uh, artworks that she just like kept on going after she got better, like it just, just appeared she, in her She loves drawings. Um, I think she continues to, she continued drawing and actually the, the background for the very presentation was a drawing of hers and a watercolor with uh, some pencil drawings which she insisted of using as the communication for the exhibition and so I wanted to pay homage to that because she kept doing many graphic work. Uh, yeah, she's a very um, medium spanning artist. I think she's a very skilled drawer but also she has a sense of space which is quite accentuated. She, she really understands space and, and time and the relationship between these two dimensions and the way people could relate to her history and uh, yes but she kept doing she keeps doing drawings yes and in what, what ways do you think that this period like 10 years is a long time like how do you think it influenced her like art before and art after this void period 
Uh, I'm sorry if it was a good presentation. No, 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 don't worry, absolutely. Um, no, no, it's something that I actually haven't mentioned. Mainly, I think, going back to this work, which is one of the first she did um, after she got a little better, uh, she wanted to incorporate uh, on an emotional level more than a technical or medium um, aspect what happened to her. And it was also a time, well, it was a very unfortunate time of her life because her parents also uh, passed away in those years. So she was really dealing with loss, uh, loss of her own physical freedom, loss of her, some very important ties, even if problematic ties, still important ties. And I think it shows in how um, emotional this work is. I think. If I had to visit her apartment, her empty apartment with the paintings of the life that she never had, I think I would have been really, I would have thought this is really strong, you know, that she can put it out there for people to come visit. And uh, I think it shows more more on the content of an elaboration of the emotions that she went through. Also this one, and this one also comes in the time where she was probably uh, elaborating on her childhood um, and it's bittersweet and it's bittersweet because the photograph is from it's definitely a time in her life where she was unhappy and kind of constrained by this very gloomy presence of her mother but at the same time there's some lightness to it there's some playfulness mm -hmm. to it you know the little tiny flowers the pink she, she loves the color pink because it's so light and usually associated with you know um, sweetness and not not a gloomy color so her work is never um, uh, openly uh, desperate it's a more of a quiet subtle desperateness <laughs> uh, it's bittersweet yes yes Julia please could we show to the students the book about uh, yes, definitely. On what side? yes I should have brought this out oh, we well I left, left it, it upstairs oh. <laughs> I left the books upstairs. Okay, in the office. never mind. Never mind. I'm sorry, but yes, we use the pink background. It was either in the book, and in, it was a kind of like a unifying trait of the exhibition, like little tiny pink accents here and there that we accepted to do. So everything from the exhibition to the book, everything was tied into this uh, view of uh, sad sweetness, so to say. With the pink. Some more questions? If not, thank you once more. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention.